We want to talk about prayer, everybody's favorite topic, right? Uh, some of you, some of you are, uh, well, most of, let me put it this way, most of us are not excited when it comes to prayer. For those of you who get excited by prayer, you're, you're, you're a good kind of weird, okay? I want you, you're a good kind of weird, and here's why. Because those of you who get excited by the topic of prayer have probably figured out the key to the Christian life. You figured out the key thing of importance in being a follower of Jesus. The Bible's teaching us, and Jesus is teaching us, here in this passage that we're going to read this morning, that the key to growing as a Christian and the, the key to maturing as a person so, not, you know, we're not just talking about the spiritual life. The, the key to both your spiritual life and the key to maturing as a person is learning how to get in your prayer closet regularly and to di- develop a, a dynamic prayer life. And if you are not doing this right now, know that you're in good company because many of us struggle with this. But if you're not doing this right now, you need to learn how to do it. Because you, you won't become a mature Christian and you won't become a deep person um, unless you learn how to pray and spend time alone with God in prayer. So, let's read the passage. It's uh, on your handout, Matthew 6, verses uh, one, um, 5 to 15. I think I invite you to stand as we read this together. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 15. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. Pray like this, our Father in heaven. May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will will not forgive your sins. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we dive into these words, um, many of which are very familiar, actually, to us, I pray that you would give us new insight and understanding, and not just in our heads, but that our hearts would be open to these truths as well, and that you will change us by your power through hearing it, and through taking it in to the very center of our being. Holy Spirit, lead us now into the truth, and we ask that the truth would set us free. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, Jesus is teaching here about prayer, and how he does it, actually, is he does it by contrast, we're going to see, is that he really is contrasting in many ways what prayer is versus what prayer is not. And, uh, and so here's what we're going to do. Let's, let's use these headings today as a way of looking at the passage. For those of you who are taking notes, sorry, I, I wasn't able to get a, a full handout, but you've got some spot to write there. So here's your three headings this morning. Formation versus formality. Formula, or sorry, uh, Framework versus formula, and father versus figure. Okay, these are our headings. Formation versus formality, framework versus formula, and father versus figure. And if some of you are feeling 
like you don't really understand what that means, don't worry, we're going to get to it, okay, as we go along. But there they are. So let's start with the first one, formation versus formality. Uh, Bill Hybels, who is, uh, used to be the pastor of Willow Creek Church in the Chicago area, very well-known church, one of the larger churches in the United States, wrote this great little book on prayer, which I would highly recommend, by the way. It's a really easy-to-read book. It's called Too Busy Not to Pray. Too Busy Not to Pray. It's a great uh, book. And he wrote this in this book. This is how he starts his book, actually. He says, prayer is an unnatural activity. It is an assault on human autonomy, an indictment of independent living. Prayer is alien to our proud human nature. I think that's a really good way to, to capture it. Many of us find prayer to be a very unnatural activity, a very hard activity, and there's many different reasons for that, and hopefully we'll, we'll hit on a few of them, and, uh, and hopefully I'll be able to, to give us some things to help us move past that. But Hybels goes on to say that in spite of how unnatural prayer feels at times and how alien it is, sooner or later we all find ourselves on our knees praying. Even if not physically, we're laying in bed, we find ourselves praying, we're, we are drawn to prayer. No matter what our, even regardless of our beliefs, regardless of we're Christian or, or, or another religious faith, or even if we're not sure, sooner or later, life will bring us to our knees and we'll, we'll be crying something out. I find it very interesting. I, don't, I can't remember the band off, uh, off the top of my head, but there's a popular song on the radio where he's, the, this, the guy who's singing is talking about his relationship with this girl, and he says, I just prayed to a God that I don't believe in. I can't remember the, the band, um, but that's one of the lines in the song, is that sometimes those of us who, who aren't even sure if we believe in God, sooner or later we find ourselves praying, and we've got to ask the question, why? Why are we drawn to prayer? Why does that seem to be, as much as it's an unnatural thing, there seems to be this instinct in us that cries out? And here's the first thing, is because prayer is absolutely necessary. Prayer is necessary. Notice something in this passage. Verse 5, 6, and 7, in all those spots, Jesus doesn't say, if you pray. He doesn't say, if you pray, pray like this. He says, when you pray. When you pray. Which means Jesus himself assumes that sooner or later we're going to. And also, there's an assumption here underneath that, that he views prayer as an absolute necessity for the Christian life, a necessity for life. Period. A necessary thing. Prayer is not an optional thing. Especially in the Christian life. Prayer is essential to our design as human beings. We are built to know God and to know Him in this somewhat strange activity of prayer. Life without prayer is like spiritually holding your breath. You know that? Essentially. If you choose not to pray... If you're, if you're a Christian, if you claim to be a Christian and you don't have any kind of regular prayer, you're, you're holding your breath spiritually. Our bodies need to breathe and our souls need to pray. It's just, it's just the way we're designed. So prayer is necessary, first of all. Jesus is showing us that. But secondly, and here's where we get, I think, really into the meat and potatoes of this particular point, is that prayer is formative. It's, it's shaping the underlying truth of this whole passage when Jesus is teaching on prayer is he's saying prayer shapes you and it's supposed to shape you. It's supposed to change you. It's, it's supposed to transform us. It's, it's formative. The prayer life of the Christian is not about the formality of a person uh, performing a ritual. It's the formation of a person pursuing a relationship. That's what prayer is. It's not performing a ritual, it's pursuing a relationship. But look at the hypocrite. In verse 5, Jesus says, the hypocrite, for him, prayer is merely a ritual they use to look good. They know how to say all the right things out in public. For the pagan, in verse 7, Jesus says, prayer is a ritual that they use to get what they want. 
So prayer for the hypocrite is about looking good. Prayer for the, the pagan is about getting what they want. And in both cases, prayer is just a means to an end. I pray in order to get something. The hypocrites use prayer to get status. Pagans use prayer to get stuff. Jesus says, don't use prayer to get status and don't use prayer to get stuff. Use prayer to get God. Pray to get God. When you pray, verse 6, when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in heaven. So, first of all, Jesus says, you got to get alone with God. You got to get somewhere, and you got to get alone, and you got to get in the quiet. You got to get to a place where you can talk with God privately, and that it's not just you speaking, but that you have a chance to hear something too. Because when we get alone with God, something happens. Something dramatic happens. What's very interesting is whenever we look in, in the Bible and we see people have encounters with God, guess what? They're alone. It says Jacob was alone when he fell asleep and he had the vision of the ladder. We're going to talk about uh, that in the fall. Um, not that we're not going to look at that particular passage, but we're going to look at how Jesus talks about that passage in John 1. Anyway, sermon preview. That's a free commercial, by the way. Free preview. Uh, sorry, my trailers are not as good as Hollywood. I, maybe I need some graphics. I need something uh, playing when I give those. Uh, but, so, but Jacob's alone has the vision. He's alone again. It says... He was alone when the angel of the Lord came and pounced on him, and he wrestled all night. It says Mo Moses was by himself when he sees the burning bush and has this experience. Isaiah has a vision in the temple. He's on his own, right? Everybody's alone. If you want to have a relationship with God, you've got to get alone. Because it's in the quiet, it's in the private, all of a sudden God starts to become very real to you. And there's a reason for that, and we'll, we'll keep getting there. Prayer is absolutely critical for your spiritual formation. Absolutely critical. So my question to you this morning is, is when you pray, is it just a formality? You know what becomes a formality is grace before dinner, right? I've often wondered, you know, when we pause and we pray, are we just going through the motions, even when we pray at dinner time? Or when we pause, are we really just recognizing a few things. Number one, who, who God is. Number one, who we really are because of him. And really recognizing his provision and a sense of thankfulness and a desire to want to keep serving him. Right? But it's just a formality. It's, it's kind of what we do, right? It's expected. We bow our heads at the, the dinner table, but we can do this alone too in our quiet time. Is your quiet time with God just a formality? Is it just that part of the day when either you get up in the morning and, and what you do is you sit down and you read your Bible and you pray because that's what you're supposed to do or you do it before you go to bed? Is it just a formality? Are you praying because you want people to think you're a good Christian or because you need to think you're a good Christian? Are you pr or are you just praying to get stuff? Is it the formality of coming and bringing your list to God and saying, okay, God, here's my list and I pray for ABC. Please take care of these things. I'd appreciate it. Or are you praying because you want to get alone with God and you want to enjoy Him and you want to let Him change you into the kind of person He wants you to be? See, when you look at the Lord's Prayer, what, what you see here is that each of these lines isn't just a petition, it's a formational statement. It's, a, it's not just a petition, not just a request, it's a formational statement in which there's something going on in this prayer Jesus gives us that is meant to change us. That's really the whole point. When properly considered and when properly prayed, this prayer, it has the power to change us. And that's the point. See, that's the point of prayer, period. It's not a means to an end. It is an end in and of itself. We, we talk to God, and in the process of meeting Him and knowing Him and enjoying Him, guess what? Something begins to happen. We get alone, we start to pour out our heart to him, we start to hear him speak back to us, we start to enjoy him for who he is, and in the process of finding out who we really are, guess what? 
we start to be changed. Now, of course, this takes time to develop. It's, uh, it's something we learn over time. It's something that deepens over time. And, he, and here's the thing I found personally. Um, th there was a little, little while ago when I started to really realize that I didn't have a very deep prayer life, that my prayer life was, was pretty shallow. And, that, uh, and also that it was very much kind of bring my list kind of thing. Even as a pastor, even praying for the church, realize it's just kind of a list I bring. You know, God be with so-and-so and so-and-so and... And, uh, and of course, it feels mechanical. It feels like that formality, right? It doesn't feel... It, and so what happens is, is it starts to feel mechanical. It doesn't, it, doesn't feel, it doesn't feel passionate, and it doesn't feel like there's any kind of life in it. But you have to work at it, and this is one of the things I've realized, is you really have to put some effort in with prayer. And at first... It, it's not that exciting, usually. You gotta, you gotta work at it, and you gotta work at it, and over time, what happens is, it's, it's slow, and it's steady. Um, the only way, really, that you develop a deep prayer life is you just gotta do it, do it, do it. And over the process of time, now, what we're gonna see here in this next part, which we're coming to right now, is that there's a certain way to approach it that will help you deepen it. Because if you just do it, as a formality and as, and as a mechanical thing over and over and over again, it won't get deep. It just gets stale. And, and then you don't get anywhere with it. But So there's, there's this question between, you know, Jesus is saying prayer is a formational thing. It's not just a formality. It's about shaping you as a person. But he's also giving us another contrast here, and that is pr seeing prayer as a framework, this prayer particularly as a framework versus a formula. Prayer is it's dynamic. Prayer is not static. Personal formation is dynamic. It's not static. In formation, it's dynamic because you're being changed. Static means something staying the same all the time. Prayer is not supposed to be like that. Formality is static. That's a static thing because you're just going through the motions. But in, this, in the same way, if you approach this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, as a formula... It'll be static for you. And this is something that I think that we've been in danger of for a long time because most of us know how to pray this prayer off by heart, Lord's Prayer. Some of you remember the days when we used to recite it in school and everything. You know, I remember that. I think, you know, even back in grade two, I think I can remember reciting the Lord's Prayer. I can't remember at what point we didn't do that anymore. But if you just recite it, you can know this thing, you can say it. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't join in this prayer publicly and, and pray. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Here's what I'm saying. Jesus is not giving us a formula for prayer. He's giving us a framework for prayer. What's the difference? Here's the difference. This is not a prayer to recite. It's a prayer to model. It's a prayer to guide your praying. That's what he's doing. Notice, he doesn't, Jesus doesn't say, when you pray, say this. He says, when you pray, pray like this. There's a big difference there. He's not saying, recite this, by the way. When you get alone with God, say these few lines. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, let these things guide your mind and heart as you pray. We're not to recite these words, we're to pray them. Here's the first petition in the prayer. May your name be kept holy. Now, the more familiar version of this, which I'm sure all of us know, is hallowed be your name. Now, this is a newer translation, New Living Translation, so it's, it's, a, it's trying to be a little bit more current. Hollow is not a word we use much, in fact, pretty much at all. But here's the thing about it. I liked hallowed. And, uh, and here's why, and here's why I think we need that great word, hallowed. There is no equivalent for it in the, new, uh, in the English language. There's nothing else that's like a complete equivalent as a word. There's something about the word hallowed, and here's what it means. The word hallowed means to hallow something is to consider and treat something as sacred and ultimate. To hallow something is to treat it as sacred and ultimate. It's to make something your ultimate concern. It's ma to make something your chief aim, the supreme beauty of your life. 
That's what it means to, to hollow something. In short, it means this. To hollow something is to adore something. Hallowed be your name. May your name be hallowed. May it be adored. May it be the supreme beauty of my life. May it be the chief, chief aim of my life. The ultimate goal of my life. And here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying when you go to pray, you need to start with adoring God. Now I believe this, I honestly believe this order is very important. On, as far as on a regular basis. I'm not saying that every time you have to start this way, but I I'm, I'm, I'm feel very strongly that most times you ought to start this way. And actually, there's probably an argument that you always ought to start this way. So let's talk about it a little bit. This is absolutely key, and here's why. Because adoration will absolutely shape the rest of your praying. It will absolutely shape the rest of your praying. Jesus says prayer needs to start with honest reflection and thought about who God is. Who He is. True life-changing prayer starts with the humbling thought of exactly who it is we're talking to. you got to start there. Who am I talking to? You're talking to the hallowed one. The one who is sacred and holy. The one who is so powerful, so majestic, and so perfect that he ought to be our ultimate concern. He ought to be the chief aim of our lives. He ought to be the supreme beauty of our lives. He's the creator. He's the sustainer of everything. He's the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present God. He's holy, he's pure, and he's perfect. There is no greater end than God. And a great way to start your prayer time every day is to start to think about what God's word says about who he is. That's, Jesus says that's where you got to start. you got to start with really thinking about who he is and not just thinking about who he is, but adoring him for who he is. Moses, once he's been leading the people of Israel for quite a while, when he gets up on the mountain with God and he's alone, he says something. He says something striking. He says something gutsy. He says, show me your glory. Show me your glory. Now, you know what? That is not a casual thing, okay? That's not Moses saying, hey, uh, you want to show me your glory? That'd be kind of cool. No, no. This is Moses having seen all that the Lord has done, and in a state of being alone with God, says, I want to see all of you. I want to see you for who you are. And God says, that's a bad idea. <laughs> because you're not going to survive it. <laughs> he says, my glory is so, if you see me really as who I am, if you really see me in my fullness, if you see my glory, it's going to kill you. He says, but here's what I will do. Because he, what does he see? Moses saying, I want to draw close. I want, to, I want to get in real close, God. I want to see you for who you are. And God says, I, I want to honor that and do the best that I can to not zap you. So here's what I'm going to do. Go over and hide in the rocks and I'm going to put my hand in front of your face and I'm going to flash by and I'll let you see my back. And that's about all you can handle. And that's what happens. He gets in the rock, God puts his hand over, over Moses, and God flashes by, and it says that the Hebrew word actually for my back actually means where I just was. It's kind of like, I can show you where I just was, because if I sh you're not going to survive. If, if, right? And what happens? Moses comes down the mountain, and his face is like, <laughs> right? And it says he had, to weigh, he had to wear a veil, because the glory of God hit him and was shining off his face. But here's the point. He said he, this was born out of his relationship with God. He says, let me get close. Let me see you. I've seen a bunch of things you've done, but I just, I want to see your, I want to see you. And God says, well, let me do the best I can. And that, that happened, and he was, he was never the same. And Jesus is saying, when you pray, before you do anything else, 
Set your heart's affections on God. Set your heart's affections. Look to adore Him. We need to start there, and we need to stay there until our heart starts to warm up, starts to heat up. I was, I was thinking about, um, when I was writing this this week, I, I started thinking about um, every Sunday morning, I iron my shirt. And uh, I won't let Jonathan iron my shirts. That's a whole other story. We won't go there. But uh, I'm, I've inherited this thing from my father where I'm really OCD about my shirts. And so I always want to iron them myself. And uh, Jocelyn's quite content to let me do that, by the way. If this is an agreement in our home, it's fine. So don't think this is a point of tension. She's not looking to iron my clothes. She's quite happy to let me do it myself. But every Sunday morning, I could iron my shirt. So I, I get out the ironing board, and I put my shirt on the, on the ironing board, and then I get the iron, and I make sure that there's water in the iron, and I got to sit there, and I turn, I plug it in, and immediately, of course, it comes on. There's no switch. And... There's, but there's different settings, and it immediately starts. I've got one of these um, pretty cool Black & Decker irons because I'm hardcore ironer, right? <laughs> so, uh, and I got this. Actually, I got this from my mother-in-law. She bought it for me a couple of Christmases ago. I was like, score. So, uh, and you, you, so you start, it starts on the lowest setting. You have to tell it to go hotter, right? So here's the thing. It starts with the white light, and I got to hit it for, and it goes, I think it goes like, Blue and then green, and then it gets once it gets to orange, there's orange and red. Orange is cottons, okay? So you got to get to cottons. I'm giving you a lesson in irony this morning. This is free, by the way. And uh, so I got to wait, but then like, this is what happens I get to orange, and then I have to stand there and wait, and the orange light starts to blink. And what that's saying is, I'm heating up, right? Now, I have to wait for it to get to a solid orange. If it doesn't go solid orange, it means it's not at the right temperature. And you know what? Your prayer life, my prayer life is like that. When you start with adoration, you know what's going on? When you start with adoration, your heart's starting to heat up. It's starting to warm up. If I take that iron, dead cold, not plugged in, and I start to try to iron my shirt, guess what's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing's going to happen because it's not hot. It's not going to be effective. And you know what? Your prayer life, my prayer life works the same way. If you really want to get close to God, you've, you've, got to, you've got to get alone with Him and you start with adoring Him for who He is and you start thinking about, reflecting on who He is. You start thinking about the glory and the beauty and guess what? Your heart starts to heat up. And that starts to change the whole rest of your prayer time. Okay? So you've got to start with adoring God and the best way I know how to do that is, is to get the word open. Start reading about, this is why the Psalms are so good, start reading about how God, who he is, what he's done. I mean, you can really go to any passage and find that. Or get some songs on in the background. You know, if you like worship songs, get some worship songs on that help start, and start thinking about what these, you know, these men and women are singing about. And uh, there's some beautiful songs out there um, you can go online and read hymns and stuff like that. I know John does that. John, John's good for that kind of thing because it, what happens? It gets our minds focused on who is God. You need to start there. You need to start letting your heart warm up and get hot. That's the adoration part. When we pray and when we adore God, we see him and our heart, here's what ha starts to happen. When you start to adore Christ, and you start to realize who he is, your heart starts to go, oh my, oh my, oh my. But something else starts to happen. See, you don't just see God for who he is, you start to see yourself for who you really are, and here's what starts, you, you move from seeing God and going, oh my, oh my, oh my, and then you see yourself and you go, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Because <laughs> in his presence and in the reality of his holiness and his purity, you start to go, ouch. You go from saying, oh, wow, to, oh, no. <laughs> He's so great, and I'm not. And that's the point, friends. See, true adoration will lead you into honest confession. Honest, this is why you need the adoration. Verse 12 says, forgive us of our, our sins. 
But if you're just reciting this prayer, if all you're doing is going, you know, just reading the prayer and you're reciting it, guess what happens? You just say, forgive me my sins, right? Or forgive us our sins. And you just keep going. You move on. But if you're praying this prayer and not just reciting this prayer, here's what happens. You stop and you take the time to actually confess your sins. And this is the great part about adoration. When you're adoring God for who He is, and you start to realize, and the Holy Spirit starts to show you the ways in which you haven't been believing that and trusting that, and you start to realize that you've been actually adoring other things, you start to go, oh man. And you're, st- you're able to speak what that is. You're able to s- tell God what that is. He knows it already, but that's important for you to recognize that and go, God, I haven't been adoring you like I should. And I've allowed other things in my life to become my focus and my aim. Forgive me. This is something I came to a personal realization lately. Starting to feel like things were stale or starting to feel like struggling with some things. And all of a sudden it hit me. I was like, ah, Mark, you haven't been spending any time really adoring Christ in your quiet time. So guess what? This week, I'm working on this sermon because I've been really feeling we need to talk about prayer. I start spending some intentional time trying to adore Christ in my quiet time. Tuesday was pretty good, not bad. Spent some time journaling. Wednesday, I thought we were going to have to repair the roof because I thought I was going through it. It was, it was just like, whoa. And you know what? It was, it was one of those things where it's like, you, you can't plan this, but it happens. And... I want to be careful about something. I'm not saying this will happen to you every time. Sometimes it'll be, you will have a real sense of God upon your heart and you will go, whoa. Other times, you don't quite get there, but you want to, you've got to keep working on it and you've got to, like I said, you've got to focus on adoring him. Let your heart heat up. But, uh, but it doesn't happen every time. But when it does, and you start to, you start to have a sense in your heart of, where your heart's been wandering and where it's been going. But let me tell you something. If you are daily having regular times of adoration of Christ, that is going to change your day. Because when your heart is set on Him and you have an awareness that's not just real to your mind or clear to your mind, but real on your heart, that empowers you. And it's meant to. And you, start, you don't just say, forgive us our sins. You start, to go, you start to list them off. You start to say, Lord, in the last 24 hours, I realized my heart went astray here. And it went here, and I, and I recognize I'm not truly worshiping you in this way and making you the center here, and it, your beauty has not been real to me. And, and you, that's, you start to go, right? Adoration moves you into confession. And then confession... We ought to come out of that, and and we ought to go into thanksgiving. I'm going to pause on this one, though, for a second, okay? And I'm going to skip over it, and we'll come back to it at the end here. Supplication. So so now you've adored Christ. You've spent some time in confession, right, and experiencing God's forgiveness. We'll come back to that. But then look look at the supplication and petition Jesus gives here. He says, give us today the food we need, right? Say, God, give me what I need today. I trust you're my provider. Give me, give me what I need today, right? And if you really are spending some time in adoration and you're realizing that maybe you're not really recognizing him for who he is and his power and, and his provision, that's going to lead you to confess, God, I'm trying to take control of my circumstances. I'm trying to be my own provider. And leads very naturally into, just give me what I need today and help me to be content with that. So that's one petition. Another one here. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, so now it's not just personal prayer for me anymore. Now all of a sudden it's group prayer. May your kingdom come in the lives of other people. You start praying and desiring for other people what God desires for them and you start asking for that. But guess what? Because you've already been adoring Christ and because you've gone through the process of recognizing maybe where you're not really adoring Him, and stuff, it starts to guide you in the way you pray for other people. It starts to transform the way you pray so that it's not just a list anymore or that if you do have a list, and I'm not saying it's wrong to have a list. I've got a list of things I'm regularly praying for, for the church, for my family, for many of you. 
Some of you got a longer list than others. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, but the, the point is, the point is this: you start to it's that adoration, the way you start. Hallowed be your name will change the way the rest of your prayer goes, including the things you pray for for yourself and for other people. May your kingdom come soon. Translation, Jesus saying, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Everything else will be added to you as well. You make God your number one concern. You start adoring him. Guess what? It becomes very natural for you to pray for certain things for yourself and for other people. And it's not mechanical anymore. There's more we could say there. But let's move into this last point because we need, to, we need to wrap up here. Is prayer formation or is it just a formality? Is it a framework to, to guide you? Is that what Jesus is giving here or is it just a formula? But finally, we have, there's one very, very important part of this prayer that we haven't talked about yet. And it's the very first line of the prayer Jesus gives. When you pray, pray like this, Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father in heaven. When you pray to God, what's the picture you have? Are you praying to a heavenly figure or are you praying to a heavenly Father? Because there is a big difference. There's a big difference between those two things. I think many of us often start off with this idea of God as heavenly figure and Jesus says, when you pray, Here's the very first thing you need to get in your mind is a picture of who you're praying to. He is not just a figure. He is our Father. This is absolutely key. We're not just dealing with a holy God, but a holy Father who loves us unconditionally. And that changes our adoration because when you start to realize that God doesn't just relate to you as as judge to to uh, whoever, you know, is in the judgment seat, right? He relates to you as a father does to a child. And let me tell you something. When you are on the stand before the judge, the judge and you have a very different relationship than if you're standing before your parent. That's very, that's very different. The way I deal with Madeline or Isaac Grace hasn't got there because she, she doesn't listen to me yet, Grace. I don't know what her problem is. But, uh, you know, she's seven months now. She should, wouldn't I say stop crying? You should stop crying, right? <laughs> but my relationship with how I deal with Isaac and Madeline, as their father, the dynamic of being their father changes that whole relationship, doesn't it? Bec- and they also know that I'm not just disciplining them, even though they may not totally understand this cognitively yet, they, there's an aspect in which they understand that when I discipline them or whatever, it's because I love them, not because I'm trying to ruin their day. Adoration is changed when you know that you're approaching a father, not just a figure. Your confession is changed, and it's deeper when you know that you're approaching a heavenly father, not just a heavenly figure, not just a heavenly judge. And here's why. You know, what, you know what I know about my dad? That even if I mess up, I'm a grown man and stuff, but even if I did something now to disappoint him, you know what I know? I know that in his heart of hearts, he loves me and he wants to forgive me. He's not looking for a reason to hold a grudge. At least, there's nothing, I, I've never felt that way about him. Now, how much more about our perfectly heavenly Father? You know when the God looks at you, and he looks at you as your heavenly father, that he is eager to forgive you. He wants to forgive you. Listen to this quote from Richard Foster. This just blew me away this week. It's, this is in his book, Prayer. God loves to forgive. It is the one thing that he yearns to do, aches to do, rushes to do. At the very heart of the universe is God's desire to give and to forgive. That's the father picture Jesus has been teaching about his whole ministry. He's saying, when you come to God, come that way, knowing he is a father who's eager to forgive you. And, when, and you feel safe in the context of that relationship with a loving father to come and say, God, I blew it. And your heavenly father goes, I know. But I love you. 
But it's, but let's be careful. It's not just about him casting off going, it's okay, don't worry about it. No, 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 no. Remember, this is a holy father we're dealing with. Sin's got to be dealt with, so what does he do? The good news is we don't just have a holy father. We've got a holy brother. We've got one who himself came and took our sins and said, I'll deal with this. I'll take this on myself so that you can know that dad forgives you. This is the way you will know. As I will take it. I will shoulder it myself. I will do it. I will take your sin on. See, there is a cost to the Father, and guess what it is? It's the Son. The Son bears the cost of our forgiveness so that we can come boldly into His presence and know that when we come in, we have a loving Father. And we have an advocate in our holy brother who says, I will do everything necessary. Father, I am pleased to do what will, what will bring you glory and what will bring them close to you. That's the picture we have. See, doesn't that change your adoration? Doesn't that change your confession? Doesn't that change the way you go? Because here's the other thing I know. You know what? When my kids want something, they come to me and they ask me if they want a snack, right? Dad, can I have a snack? If they don't go to the drawer and just pull it out, which is what tends to happen with Isaac at six in the morning, he helps himself to the cookies. Uh, but they come to me, and it's even a small thing. Dad, I need a pair of scissors to open this or whatever. They come to me with the seemingly small things because there's a sense in which they feel safe in the context of that loving relationship. They know they can come to me with anything. And that changes your supplication and your petition, your petitionary prayer, because you go to God knowing he cares about the little things. He cares about the little things in your life. He wants the absolute best for you, friends. And it's because he is a father that we can have confidence that he's interested in all the small details in life that we tend to think he, that we don't want to bother him with. You can go to him with anything. Anything. Friends, when you come to God in prayer, what's your prayer life look like? Is it just a list? Is it mechanical? Is it formal? Or are you coming to a heavenly father and spending moments just enjoying him for who he is. is. And is that changing you? Is that transforming your prayer life? We don't have a heavenly figure. We have a heavenly father. Jesus doesn't give us a formula. He gives us a framework. And friends, prayer should never feel like a formality. It should be a joy as the Holy Spirit is forming us into the image of our true holy brother, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us this prayer. And, and God, I pray that you will help us to understand how to, how to use it and how to let it begin to transform us because we need to be changed. We need to be transformed. And Jesus has given us everything here that tells us how and why. God, I pray that you would help us to deepen our, our prayer life by beginning to learn how to adore you with our whole heart and that we won't be afraid to confess because we'll know that you are a loving Father. And Lord, I, I pray that it, <laughs> the point I didn't touch on this morning and said I would, that that would lead us into incredible thanksgiving, that we would be thankful in our, in our expressions of prayer to you for all you have done for us, all you are doing, and that that thankfulness and gratefulness would shape the way we pray for ourselves and for others and for our world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.